Now imagine that in this room, all the electricity we're using, the water you just have been drinking, that that is basically produced from the toilet floss you also are doing today. Oh! <laughs> That's what we call the hidden power of the toilet floss. Now, I'm sure this about maybe generating energy is okay, but the thoughts about drinking wastewater, probably not a lot of you like. Now, uh, the fact is that nature, in fact, have created a situation that we have done that for the last many, many, many years. Because the only thing nature do is to reuse the water which is on this planet. So whether you like it or not, you probably are drinking some water which uh, for, what do I know, 100 years ago was wastewater. So that is an issue. Now, the problem is that some places on the planet, they are really running into water scarcity. For instance, in Australia and California. And there, the nature is not fast enough to generate new water. So they have to deal with it in a different way. Now, what they are doing there is basically they are taking drinking water or wastewater, the outlet from the wastewater facility, and upgrade it directly to drinking water. That is possible. The technology is there. Going 10 years back, they didn't uh, like it, but nowadays they like it, and it's safe, I can tell you. But that is really done. And uh, the same you could apply, or they apply in uh, California and other places. Another example on where they are using, in fact, wastewater without thinking about it for drinking water purposes, all the people living along rivers. If you take the Rhine River in Germany, then it's used 14 times before it runs out. Try to imagine for a second. The whole flow, all the water, taking in, used, put back, 14 times. So the people living at the end before it runs out, <laughs> try to imagine what they are in. They don't know it. <laughs> they don't think about it. The Thames River is used 12 times, Mississippi 28 times. So uh, there's a lot who already are used to that. Now, there's a lot of water consumer on this planet. And what you think about is, of course, the water you use in your home, what you are drinking, what you use for washing, what you use for your toilet, as we spoke about. And that is so typical 200 liters per day per person or something in that level. But did you know that during the same day where you use these 200 liters, you are eating more than 2,000 liters of water. So the amount of water which has been used to provide the food for you is in fact 10 times higher than the water you use in your private home and what you see. The same apply for the, the power generation that all or 90% of all our power generation on the planet depend on that is water available for cooling purpose. And it's real life in India, they shut down their power stations because they have to, there's no water for cooling. So with these things and knowing that we a lot of places are using a lot more water than neighbor, uh, nature are able to regenerate, World Economic Forum have predicted that a water crisis within the next 10, 15 years is one of the most likely crises this planet will hit. For the simple reason that if we don't have water enough or don't understand how to use it more sensible than we do nowadays, then it's not only a question about that you don't have water in your tap, it's also a question about you have no food and you have no power. And this is already happening in different places around the globe. So it's coming, and it's coming very fast. Some of you could maybe think, ah, can that really be true? 
because basically 70% of this planet is covered with water. There must be plenty of water. Now, the problem is that only 0.6% is fresh water. So it's only 0.6% of all that water which can be used either for food production or used in your private home. So that's the amount of water we have to deal with. Now, on top of that, the water is very uneven split on the planet. There's places which look like you see here, where there's far too much water. There's other places, sad enough, which look like this, where there's too little water. And there's certainly a lot of places where it looks like this, where it's really dirty. We are only treating around about 20% of all wastewater on the planet here. So, I believe we have really a water challenge. On the one hand, we are in lack of water, which have influence not only on what you consume, but also on the food production, on the energy production. And at the same time, we have a water industry in itself, which consume a tremendous lot of energy, and I'll come back to that. Having said that, and looking at here, we have our power plant, which use a tremendous lot of energy. Then you'll see at the same time down in the underground here, and that's coming back to the invisible thing. That in the underground you have all these pipes. And one of the paradox in the water industry is that even though in the part of the world where they are lacking water and are very creative about moving icebergs from Greenland, and what do I know? They have our crazy ideas trying to provide water. They at the same time accept that there's 30, 40 percent of the water leaking out in the underground. If they fix that, they don't need to think about icebergs or all other funny things. So if we look a little bit at the leakage and what we could do about it, then on a global scale, it is so that it's claimed that around about 25 to 30 percent of all the water which are entered into the drinking water system is leaking out. The highest figure I have heard about is out from Asia, that was 80 percent. Imagine only 20 percent of the water they enter into the system finally got to a customer. The rest of it was just leaking. Crazy, yeah? And what people tend to forget is that one thing, you lose all the water. But you have spent a tremendous lot of energy and money on providing clean water and put it into the pipe and put pressure on it. You also lose all that. So what to do about it? The first thing which, of course, come to mind is to say, yeah, but then I need to replace my pipes to some new pipes. And for sure, if you have serration like that, I have no other solution. You need to replace your pipe. But the fact is that the real leakage, which, where the big amount of leakage is coming from, is basically not from pictures like this, because they will be fixed within five, six hours, and then they are fixed. The real leakage is all the small leakage you'll have down in the pipe underground, which nobody can see. That's what really creates the leakage. What an alternative solution to this is, is to split the city network into what we call pressure zones. And it's not more complex than if you have one water work taking care of two million people. Then we all know that the insert of pipe is a water loss when you move the water. So at the water work, you would need to have extremely high pressure to be sure that the lady living at the end of the pipe also have some pressure. Back to what Lars was talking about this morning, <laughs> in fact, on, on the heating side, exactly the same issue. Now, if you split the city into pressure zones, and I think London is split into, I think, 800 pressure zones, if I recall right, then you would be able also at the waterwork to lower the pressure down to what the pressure need is that you have enough pressure on the tap. And so you could lower the pressure dramatically in the whole city. And what will happen also with the leaks you already have 
If you have less pressure on, less water will run out. It's that simple. So the day where you implement that, basically without digging one single pipe off, you have reduced your water leakage. Typically, statistic from 112 systems around the globe say around about 40% you'll gain, reducing your water leakage. The good news is then, besides that, you cut your energy consumption with 40%. And on top of that, it has shown that the amount of new leaks, because now the pressure is lower, is reduced with 50%. So you'll get a much more stable water supply and more happy customers doing that at the same time as you save on your water and you save on your energy side. We have been dealing with that in Denmark for quite some years. We had to. I think it's similar to some of the other stories. We have also been in deep shit and I probably are in different ways. But certainly that was also the case on the water side. We were using far more water than was sustainable long term. One of the things we have done is to cut our leakers down to 6% which together with the guys in Japan is the lowest figure you'll find on the planet. To add to that, what we also have done is we have spent a lot of time teaching the kids what they should tell the parents when they get home, how to be sensible about using water. And we have dealt a lot with the industry side also. The consequence of that is that if you look at this graph, then we have had 35 years where we have close to 100% growth or 80% growth in our economy. And at the same time, have been able to cut our water consumption with 40%. Now, the people really looking into circular economy and sustainability, they say there's only one way we'll be able to survive on this planet. That is if we get the capability to decouple economical growth from resources. That's exactly what this is about. So this is possible. And it's even a good payback on it. I just learned here in the break that the electricity prices, doot, 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 as well as I heard also the prices on heat, is going very fast up here in the country. And in fact, I was told that the electricity prices right now is on level with what they are in Denmark. They're the same level. And they probably will increase even further. So when we talk about two to three years payback in Denmark, you would see the same thing, and probably in two years' time it would be even lower. And if you take what was also popular in the morning to talk about low-hanging fruit, then you'll see something down on five, six months where you start, and maybe some of the other ones on three, three years. But it's really good thing to, to, to invest in. So that was something about the leakage side of it. Then you have the whole wastewater industry. And the fact is that if you take the wastewater and you take the drinking water side, then these facilities on a global scale are using around about 4% of all electricity, according to IEA. That is equivalent to seven times as much electricity as are being used here in Ukraine. Or it's also equivalent to around about 60% of all electricity produced from solar and wind facilities on this planet. So if I now could do this completely anti neutral, if I could turn all this business in, I would save a tremendous lot. What is the issue about wastewater facilities and how are they in fact working? Without going in detail, what basically is happening is that you have wastewater coming with a lot of dirty stuff. We all know where it's coming from, thinking about our toilet floss. Uh, and what the wastewater facility do is to separate this. And the side stream which we get is something we call slots. And that slots you can turn into what is called a digester and heat it up. And when you do that, you'll get biogas out. And now we are there. And this is not new. That have been around for the last 30 years. There's nothing new in this. So you are able to produce biogas from these facilities. And that means that you are able to generate energy out of your facilities. Now, the problem about wastewater facilities have something to do with Hollywood. 
Because the problem is, if they in Hollywood make a real good movie and present that for you, then probably half of the Ukrainian people will sit and watch that movie. When then the commercial come on, you'll probably do the same thing as we do in Denmark. Everybody run out and go to the toilet. And the rest go out and make some coffee. Now, if you were Madian, that one million people go to the toilet and floss it at the same time. Can you imagine what happened out on the wastewater facility? Maybe the flow was down here, now, now it's up to the roof there, yeah? That's the way the industry is, there's nothing to do about it, and we cannot claim Hollywood for it, I know. But the fact is that if you are not able to adjust your facility so that it follows the load, you have on your facility, then you would have to operate at 100%. It's again back to what Lars said, that, 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 that if, if you have a wealth where, where, where just a constant, and it, that, that will not work. There's so much to gain if you had sensors which could detect that now we only is on 10% of max load, and you had wireball speed drive which were able to turn the pumps down so that they don't work more than what is needed. And it's that simple, of course there's some technology into it, but it's that simple that if you follow what the real need is, you can create amazing results. What they have created, we have seen a lot both in Denmark and US and Germany is coming where you see a wastewater facility turning from a high energy consumer into a being energy neutral, not using energy. Now, the best facility I know is in Aarhus in Denmark. They are producing 134% more energy than they need for cleaning the water. Just on household wastewater, so that could be from this room. No tricks, no solar, no wind, nothing. Just the household wastewater. So they produce 134% more water, or, or more energy than they need. Now, that energy can be used to turn the pumps for the drinking water side. And therefore, they have created the first place on the planet where you have 200,000 people which get clean water and get the wastewater treated without using energy. Quite amazing, yeah? And as we have heard a little bit this morning again, it's not a rocket to the moon. It's not a new wastewater treatment process. It's traditional activated slot treatment plants. It's traditional groundwater-based uh, drinking water facilities. What is new is that there's a tremendous lot of sensors. There's what we, of course, like viable speed drives on everything so that we follow exactly what the real need is here. So, I think now we could take the power plant away. IEA have calculated on this and was extremely conservative. So they only calculated that we could take 70 power plants out globally. And that is extremely conservative. I know they will redo their calculations now and we'll come to a lot higher figure. But that's what, what some of the potential is in this. So not only is the power plant gone, now is also all the leaking gone here in the underground. And with the electricity prices you have here, with a very good payback. So, I think I would like to leave you with one thought. The next time you go and flush the toilet, think about the hidden potential in what you are flushing and do something about it. Thank you.